um i think the first thought um, that uh, you know uh, could possibly be there in a, a young manager's uh, mind or for somebody who's taking up a managerial role for the first time is how do i create trust within the team right when there is trust there is transparency right so um, so i you know and that's really the starting step right of creating a healthy work uh, culture so uh, so how do i trust my people more and you know uh, and uh, empathy and trust combine in a way uh, to give an example say you know so an employee says that you know in the morning i'm not able to work because i have to take uh, somebody to the hospital or i have an exam or you know whatever they or my daughter's uh, pta meeting is there or whatever uh, but i will stretch in the evening so you know this is the outcome that needs to be get done uh, by the end of the day today it will be done but um, but i need some flexibility to get you know to manage my personal aspects so how do you you know build that uh, the culture where people feel safe to speak up and yet you're uh, putting in uh, enough structure and processes to ensure outcomes so it's a fine line to tread uh, but it's uh, you know it's a very a possible line to tread once you start uh, on that path Hi everybody and welcome to another session of the Angry Coach. Today I am extremely privileged of having Dr. Shalini Duggal along with us. Dr. Duggal is an organization psychologist and has a doctorate in this entire uh, area of work. She has spent the last 20 years in building organizations with positive psychology and empathy. It's an area that she's extremely passionate about her about and I'll be delighted to talk more on this with you shalini welcome to our show hi vivek uh, glad to be a part of this thanks for inviting me our pleasure shalini as we start a question what makes you angry um so i think what makes me angry um, when i look around uh, you know uh, you know in my professional uh, spaces any kind of a toxic element uh, which exists um, from a culture perspective uh you know anything that is um, maybe not very supportive uh, towards employees uh, possibly uh you know uh, and it's a strong word to use but abusive uh, in some way or you know something uh, that doesn't promote a healthy work culture uh, that's what um, gets me angry that's such an amazing thing and you know what i think it makes all of us angry as well right i spent the last 20 23 odd years working and anything which is toxic anything that prevents healthy working as an environment is something that would make us angry any examples that you can share around this um so i think uh, you know there are plenty of examples uh, that go around and uh, maybe without uh, specifying uh, you know uh, a, you know a particular uh, instance but um, i can talk about you know uh generally speaking there are uh, you know employees who reach out with managers who are you know are not very supportive in terms of something as basic as granting leaves uh, in the times of personal exigencies uh, employees are afraid to speak up uh, you know uh, regarding these issues fearing any you know some kind of a repercussion uh, from the hands of the manager um, or you know even uh, talking about it in an open manner so you know and apart from their personal um, you know uh, sort of you know uh, uh, challenges or you know things that they want to talk about even from a workplace standpoint uh, i've seen employees who are afraid to come up with ideas or speak openly about uh, you know with a different opinion uh, regarding uh, some workplace uh, aspect uh, because there's no concept of psychological safety right so if they speak up uh, you know with a differing viewpoint uh, people are not uh, very you know feel very safe about how it will be taken uh, you know going forward at the time of maybe feedback or appraisal or you know any of those things so maybe those are some instances uh, broadly speaking that's a very fair statement so what i'm hearing from you is i am unable to speak up because perhaps my manager or the organization is unable to provide this thing called psychological safety is that correct that's right I'd be curious about this term psychological safety. What is it? What does it mean for an organization? Anything that you'd love to share? Sure. So I think in very basic terms, it means that um, you know there's a work uh, environment created where employees feel safe to speak up, 
right and by speaking up it could be about um, you know one uh, their personal uh, issues maybe some things uh, you know are bothering me uh, at the home front maybe i'm you know not able to sort of uh, for some time uh, contribute 100% because of a personal exigency uh, which could be you know maybe to do with uh, some you know a family member's illness or you know any such thing but uh, people feel afraid to voice it because they fear a repercussion or even um, you know to come up with uh, anything different that they want to implement at the workplace which doesn't go uh, according to the manager's uh, line of thought or the leadership's line of thought because there's no concept of safety so they don't know how it will be taken and how it will come back to them so uh, it's really about creating that safe working uh, environment that's that's where in basic terms that's what it implies so basically if i am an employee i i hesitate speaking up because i don't know the way it's going to be interpreted by my manager or management uh, now it could be a personal issue for example i need leave because and then you are a little scared how will it be taken so you'd rather perhaps in some cases just lie about it oh i'm not well or something else because you're not sure of if you can speak the truth in the right way and the second instance that you also shared is um it limits innovation because i tend to keep my ideas to myself not knowing whether if i share it how will it be taken that's and what if it is a stupid idea then will people laugh at me will my manager say are vivek doesn't have any good ideas and so these two elements of inability to speak my personal issues and inability to share my ideas because of the fear of being thought less is something that reduces psychological safety that's right vivek and i think it comes from a space of um, basic trust right so is there a culture of trust um, you know within the team or within the organization do i trust my manager that you know is my manager's uh behavior predictable in a positive way right so uh can i uh, expect uh, you know if not say uh, you know guarantee to you know uh, support me but at least uh, empathy at least an understanding of um, you know one maybe my situation if it's a personal issue or at least uh, you know uh, say an acknowledgement uh, of you know what i'm trying to achieve or my effort if it's a uh, idea that i want to propose so is that trust uh, really there as a uh, foundation you know, within you know the cultural setting i think it essentially kind of comes from that space so is there trust that is prevalent in the system is is a place where it originates from so that's like the that's like the base of an iceberg so to speak that's like the big huge monolith below the water which is trust and if trust is present then at the surface people will be speaking up they will be opposing they will be doing what is essentially right for an organization that's right that's right trust is such a heavy word right and you hear this term at pretty much every juncture and and whenever i ask people hey okay how do you build trust for example and this is a this, we're talking about this in a professional setting not in a personal setting right um so in a professional setting building trust what could be some things that a leader would could do or what are some ways in people which leaders damage trust I, i'm just curious about this term sure so i think uh, trust comes from uh, the space of uh, transparency right it comes from a space of where you establish credibility by saying what you're going to do right and doing what you're going to say right uh, essentially it kind of uh, boils down to that right so if over a period of time i have uh, you know i've sort of proved that uh, you know you can rely on my word uh, you know and it uh is you know it's a precedent or an antecedent uh, to my actions um, uh you know that's what builds trust right so um you know and uh, trust is something which uh, different people approach in different ways right so some uh, you know some managers or some people may start off with trust right so i trust you unless you prove me wrong right so that's one way of approaching trust uh, the other uh, way is that i will not trust you till the time you've proved yourself you prove it hmm. yeah so um, and maybe you know environments which are uh, slight you know verge on the toxic side uh, possibly uh, you know uh, kind of incorporate the second approach right so i will not trust you till the time you don't prove yourself to be trustworthy so i start off with this first and uh, you know all of my actions are then stemming from that uh, belief um, so it's it's really you know what is your approach to trust do you have a you know positive approach so of course you're still being cautious um, in the first uh, case where you say that i will trust you 
till the time you tr- prove to me that maybe um, you know i should not trust you uh, you're still being cautious you know it's not a blind approach uh, towards trusting people it's still you know uh, you know you're still alert uh, to you know uh, any signs that uh, may prove otherwise but you you're starting off on a healthy note so you know so you say that um, you know i know uh, you know you deserve trust and i'm going to go with that right so such a fair statement so what you're telling me is that uh, there are two states in which people can start one is i trust you until you prove me wrong and the second state is i will not trust you until you prove otherwise and a lot of us tend to default towards this second one um, and when we do that it kind of uh, re uh, focuses reemphasize this mistrust element and we end up becoming either micromanagers taking at a task level and the more we do that the less the person feels trusted and less responsible towards outcome yeah uh, also vivek i think it ties in with say uh, you know what is called the pygmalion effect or the rosenthal effect okay. or a self fulfilling prophecy so you know so if i start off thinking that you're not trustworthy uh, my actions are likely to be aligned to that thought process and like you brought out that i could be micromanaging or you know i may uh, sort of step into everything that you're doing or dismiss uh, your ideas or any of those things and chances are that you know you the the person i'm dealing with will live up to those expectations right versus the fact that i start off saying that you know i know you can do this i know you're committed to the job i believe that you require minimum supervision because uh, you know uh, you're accountable and you know i trust uh, you know your actions uh, and chances are because i'm giving you uh, you know that uh, sort of space to start off you're likely to live up to that right uh, and of course there are exceptions in uh, you know both uh, directions but uh, largely speaking on, on an average uh, you know what you do is what you get right in a wow a very good name way that's such a fantastic thing and i really love this term that you shared which is self fulfilling prophecy and to a very large extent it's true right um uh shalini i'm going to shift gears a little bit over here and move this from a very uh, organization focused conversation to you okay i i'm just very curious what got you into this uh, line of thinking work direction sure so um so i i've studied psychology uh, as part of my uh, you know education so i've uh, i've done my uh, you know uh, my graduate my undergraduate post graduation and my phd and a positive psychology is something that i got interested in and it was my area of research uh, during my uh, you know my doc- uh, phd um, at that time i studied concepts like resilience um, i studied grit uh, for example uh, you know mindfulness all of those things so so i think i you know maybe i got primed uh, to thinking like that or i was already primed and you know which is i picked up these uh, concepts so i don't know which of uh, those happened um, but i you know but the, i i think also uh, it it's something which naturally appeals to me i uh, uh, you know i consider myself as somebody who's uh, high on empathy so i think um, you know these things uh, resonate with me which is why i got interested wow and now you focus on organizations and help them build this mindset of positive psychology as well as empathy that's right love to hear more about this um, and of course no names or anything but love to hear some experiences some cases transformation journeys that you've experienced um so sure. so um you know as a manager uh, in my own organization um this is something that i consciously practice uh with uh, you know the people that i work with um so this is something that uh, you know so uh, i i you know react from a space of empathy and trust uh, that's what i uh, try and do also in many of the programs uh, you know that we run um, as you know as part of uh, you know the lnd uh, offerings uh, empathy trust uh, etc these the, i think there's a there's a lot more acceptance a lot more acknowledgement of the significance of these concepts so uh, there's a natural um, you know uh, sort of uh a need for this uh, you know especially after the covid uh, lockdown where uh, you know aspects of mental health have become a more mainstream and it's more acceptable to uh, talk about these uh, things uh, mm. i think you know uh, some of the things uh, that kind of go hand in hand are the concepts of trust and empathy uh, you know from a manager so, standpoint 
So, so, uh, so you know, those things are built into some of the programs. We, you know, we drive it uh, with the managers, we, uh, you know, with the leadership um, at the employee individual level. So, so those things are happening. Uh, I think, you know, um, maybe one of the cases I can uh, talk about is um, of an employee who, uh, uh, you know, wanted uh, professional growth and uh, was kind of. Uh, you know, not able to get it in the normal uh, sort of routine on th- uh, of things because of, you know, the tenure being short, etc. And, uh, uh, you know, the employee went ahead and uh, put in his resignation right, because uh, they had a better offer outside. Um, however, uh, you know, post uh, discussion with the manager and, you know, this was uh, uh, before uh, the, you know, the discussions had started and this was more of a reactive uh, stance after uh, the appraisal outcome, etc. But, a post discussion with the manager uh, who took uh, you know uh, an approach of uh, you know of empathy of not taking it personally uh, to say that you know just because the employee is resigned um, you know suddenly the employee is now no more an ally but more of a foe you know, because <laughs> you decided yeah. to uh, quit the organization hmm. so not operating from that space uh, still continuing to show uh, you know whatever uh, builds engagement uh, for the person uh, you know uh, so the employee eventually took their resignation back and came on board as, uh, and is now performing uh, really well. So that's just maybe a small um, story of transformation. Wow. And it also highlights the importance of empathy in just employee retention. Correct. Um, if I believe that I am thought of as an equal in the organization, if I believe that I matter in an organization, my probability to remain there will be higher. Uh, right. versus if I am considered as just a person who needs to type and get some things done. So very, very I agree. I, uh, yeah. Also, just to add to that, I think concepts lo- like, you know, uh, what you said about uh, the person mattering, right? So who I matter, right? So, uh, and those things really also come about by uh, maybe building a sense of purpose uh, for the employee, helping them connect to, you know, kind of what they're doing, how it really adds up in the larger scheme of things. So apart from, you know, doing the relationship building, doing the uh, connect with the employee uh, and, you know, doing the autonomy where you're practicing a lot of trust, um, I think the, you know, uh, bringing in some element of meaning and, you know, connecting it to uh, the individual's purpose and whatever that purpose could be, right? And everybody is seeking different things in life. So how does, um, you know, how does your work kind of uh, add up to what you want in the larger scheme of things? I think... Uh, doing that also, you know, uh, ultimately leads to better uh, performance, better retention and more satisfaction, I think, for an individual apart from the organ- uh, organization uh, outcomes, also the personal uh, satisfaction or, um, uh, you know, overall happiness index kind of increases. That's a very fair statement. So what I'm hearing from you is uh, organizations that are able to instill this sense of purpose in their people and are therefore able to unite people towards a common outcome or a common goal, will experience that people are A, more connected with the organization and also in general more happy uh, working over there. Is that fair? Uh, I think that's completely fair. That's a nice way to sum it up. Ah, interesting, interesting. Thank you so much for sharing this. This is very helpful. I have a question for you and this is perhaps a personal problem as well. And I bet I echo a lot of managers who want to be empathetic and also deliver results at the same time, right? Um, A lot of people tell me something like this, uh, Vivek, you know what? I have to keep these people tight because the moment I will let go of the reins or the moment I let things go, you will just find a general misalignment, erosion. And if I start becoming empathetic, then everybody starts giving me excuses of why something cannot be done. And I'm running a ship here, right? I'm running a business over here. Uh, I need to get work done no matter what the cost. So how do you weigh in this element of empathy as a manager versus getting things done? Sure. So, um, so you know, what you described to me, um, the, the underlying emotion I pick up there is that of fear. Right? So it's a need for very high control. Right? So everything has to go as per what I want. Right. So I define the outcomes. I define the ways to get to that outcome. Right. And everybody or everything has to adhere to that. Now, uh, that's one way of running ship. Um, and maybe, uh, 
you know, not the most uh, sort of open uh, uh, way of uh, running it. Maybe, you know, if the more you try and uh, curb people, the more, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, to maybe use that word, maybe, um, you know, claustrophobia it, or suffocation it could lead to. Right? So if I, I know that I need to prepare an Excel and I can only prepare it in X way, which is the correct way of doing things. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, uh, my my own uh, sort of, uh, you know, a motivation to do it, um, the intrinsic motivation may go away. Right? So why I'm doing it is because of fear, because I have to do it in X way and X way has to be correct. Or it is some extrinsic mot uh, motivation in which I'm getting, say, you know, some kind of a reward, in, a monetary reward, some kind of public recognition and all of those things. But my internal motivation uh, somewhere possibly uh, goes away. Right? Um, now, uh, you know, one way of uh, doing this is to, to maybe create the structures to contain uh, the effort. So, you know, you create the boundaries, you create the processes, and those have to be adhered to, uh, you know, very strictly. Right? So, the out while the outcomes are defined, but the you know manner in which you get to the outcome, uh, if there is some autonomy given, uh, you know, in that space, uh, that builds motivation. Right. So I'll try different ways. I'll try maybe a better way uh, than what my managers told me, and maybe that'll help save cost for the company or you know give better timelines. But if I have to do everything in that defined manner, then you know it really has an implication of where the the company is going after a, a number of years. Right. So if the manager operates from a space of fear, uh, the fear percolates down the team, right? And it's really about letting go and seeing, you know, how can you create structures or processes that allow innovation, allow uh, a healthy discussion and still get you great outcomes. That's a very fair statement. So what I'm hearing from you is that um, uh, if a manager is, I want to be empathetic, but how do I get work done? then the manager needs to self-introspect and see if the plane that he's operating from, is he or she operating from a plane of fear and therefore a need of control? Or he's, he or she actually operating from a space of empowerment? And you've, you've helped define that to a certain extent as well, which is um, define the outcomes or create those common goals. And maybe we can call it like a, like a team's purpose or a team's goal. And then let people figure their way towards that outcome that's right that's right that's a very fair point thank you so much uh, for sharing this shalini uh, as we wrap up i'd have one more question for you um to a young manager to a manager who is starting off leading others what would some of your key tips be so that they can become more empathetic and positive managers for their teams um, I think the first thought uh, that, uh, you know, uh, could possibly be there in a, a young manager's uh, mind or for somebody who's taking up a managerial role for the first time is how do I create trust within the team, right? When there is trust, there is transparency, right? So, um, so I, you know, and that's really the starting step, right, of creating a healthy work uh, culture. So, uh, so how do I trust my people more and, you know, uh, and uh, empathy and trust combine in a way uh, to give an example, say, you know, so an employee says that, you know, in the morning, I'm not able to work because I have to take uh, somebody to the hospital or I have an exam or, you know, whatever they, or my daughter's uh, PTA meeting is there or whatever, uh, but I will stretch in the evening. So, you know, this is the outcome that needs to be get done uh, by the end of the day today. It will be done, but, um, but I need some flexibility to get, you know, to manage my personal assets. So how do you, you know, build the, uh, the culture where people feel safe to speak up and yet you're uh, putting in uh, enough structure and processes to ensure outcomes? So it's a fine line to tread, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a very uh, possible line to tread once you start uh, on that path. So you're saying very consciously put an effort on building trust. Uh, right. Give people or create an environment where people can speak up. And That's naturally, you will end up becoming a good manager. That's right. This is interesting. I'm going to push you a little further with your permission, Shalini. Um, sure. This is for a young manager, right? Um, what would your advice be for an executive leadership? So let's say the CXOs of an organization or CEOs of an organization. What can they do to build a positive, empathetic culture in their organizations? 
uh, so one is um, you know to define the set of values uh, that you want to uh, percolate in the system right and those uh, values could be say trust they could be respect they could be integrity or any of those things right so uh, that's really uh, step one uh, the second is uh, do you walk the talk right so any kind of culture creation really comes from the top so are you you know uh, doing what you say right so are you establishing your credibility in those uh, you know for those values that you're trying to define uh, so that's the second the third is uh, to also have your ear to the ground right so so while you know you could be doing everything you could have defined the kind of culture you want you're walking the talk but are you clued in to what's happening in the organization right so are there uh you know is that culture really ha- uh, being percolated or are there micro cultures which have su- uh, sprung up uh, in pockets so be aware and uh, address those i think those are some of the things that could be done mm. so first is define the values that you really want an organization to display second is make sure that you walk the talk so if you say respect uh, don't be disrespectful to your own people or be dismissive of their own ideas around the same is that correct that's right Hmm. I think that's a very, very fair point. And then let the culture percolate across the organization. Yes. Uh, Shalini, thank you so much for this time today. It was a pleasure having you and hearing you. Uh, as we leave, any last thoughts that you'd like to share? Uh, so, uh, so Vivek, thanks for having me on this show. I completely enjoyed this conversation, and this is a subject which is very close to my heart. So, it's uh, it was great uh, to talk about it. and thank you for uh, adding to my thoughts along the way excellent 